I want to keep my continuity with what I was talking about at the end of the last hour by saying that victory over feelings is a primary part of the deliverance which salvation is. Victory over feelings. Uh, we are, as a people, so victimized by feelings, and partly due to the fact that we're encouraged to think that um, we should feel good. And if we don't feel good, there's something wrong. And uh, it may be somebody else's fault, but there's something wrong, and we should fix our feelings. And uh, I really hope that we can have a clearer view of what they are. And, uh, and not be dominated by them. Uh, seeing them for what they are is half the battle. And uh, questioning them and saying, why should I be bothered by that? Or why should I feel like I must change that? Uh, is Sometimes the best thing you can do with feelings is ignore them and get on with something good. Like it's a well-known thing in mental health that a person who is depressed is apt to be tremendously helped if they can just get in action and especially if they can get involved with helping someone else. Uh, I tell my students what I believe is true, that I have never met a person who was devoted to service to others that was troubled about the meaning of life. I have never met such a person. And I like to say these things because maybe someone will say, here, we've got one. <laughs> and I don't know if it's just that they're intimidated by it somehow, but I've never had anyone show that. And I've seen people with tremendous problems and pains and all of that, and they never thought to question the meaning and goodness of life. And I've seen many people who, as we say, were born with silver spoons in their mouth and they can't find any reason to live. And their feelings overwhelm them. And they, be, they become concerned to just minister to their feelings. Now, I know it's a serious problem. I am not making fun of it. Uh, what I am saying is we can find a way uh, to deal with those and to change them. And the way is to turn our minds in the direction of hope and help and goodness, and that's primarily the, the English for, word for that is God, uh, frankly. Uh, but, of course, Paul in, First Corinthians, in Philippians 4, uh, 4, 8, tells us whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever. Is, and this guy was sitting in jail when he wrote this and he practiced it and so he's telling these folks in Philippi rejoice rejoice in the Lord rejoice always how do you do that well you can't just as there's an old song we used to sing in Sunday school sing and smile and pray that's the only way for if you sing and smile and pray you'll drive the clouds away <laughs> Yeah, but there's more to it than that. <laughs> that, that might be a good start. Uh, and it is an action, and it will help you. But we need to find the deeper sources of joy and peace. I'm uh, really, I like uh, 2 Peter 1, the salutation. 2 Peter 1, 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. In the knowledge of God. Isn't that interesting? Grace and peace in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, how do you understand peace? Um, peace is not an absence of something. It's not an absence of, uh, of uh, trouble. Or You can have peace in the midst of trouble. Let me just suggest to you, try it on. Uh, peace is an awareness of abundance. Peace is an awareness of abundance. And actually, I think the Hebrew word shalom 
which we translate in peace is really best understood in terms of a kind of abundance. Abundance for the things that uh, we live in, we live among, we trust in, and we are assured because of God's kingdom that we are living in, we are assured of abundance. Now, it's kind of paradoxical because you can be assured of abundance uh, when you're hungry and, uh, and when there, there may be threats because the assurance does not rest upon the realities of the visible landscape. Remember the two landscapes? The one you can see and the one you can't. Okay. The assurance is of the resources of God to you, which Paul, again in Philippians, refers to when he says, My God shall supply all your need by his riches in, how do you say it? Glory. Glory. <laughs> That's how you say it. And his riches and glory are, frankly, just the resources of the kingdom of God. Right? Peace. Peace. Grace. Peace. Be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. Now, forgive me if I go back over and over and re-explain the meaning. Knowledge is interactive relationship. It's, it's what you're actually experiencing as you live in the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom of God is the range of God's effective will. It's where what God is doing prevails. That's the kingdom of God. So it's active. Grace is active. Knowledge is active. And we make a place for that after we understand it. We make a place for it in our daily existence as we go along. We watch for it. We expect it. And then it's multiplied. Not just added, but multiplied. Multiply goes up faster, doesn't it, than addition. So you're, you're really growing in this. And as we've been talking, the outcome is, of course, where you come to the place to where you do everything in the name of Jesus, that is, on his behalf and from his resources. So now I'd just like to repackage all of that as we get started again tonight and have you thinking about it in terms of the victory over feelings. And sometimes uh, these feelings come in the form of desires, and desires cause us a lot of trouble. So we need to be able to take control of them and dominate them. And as we have uh, said, uh, a part of what you goes into if you're changing desires is to desire to not desire what you now desire. <laughs> uh, that's the stage. So I don't want this, whatever that desire is. And remember, desires are not bad in themselves, but they cause a lot of trouble and they are death on you whenever you let them guide your life. So we can, we can look at the things that trouble so many people, the desires and the feelings. Some feelings are not desires. Loneliness, for example. A feeling of no one caring for you. Uh, does your life matter? Uh, uh, have I been successful? That's a big one. Really hard on people. In a society that stresses success so much. And so then as we turn our minds to God, the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of God, then there is multiplied to us grace and peace. Grace and peace. Now that's a piece of instruction that we have about the spiritual life. And we can do that. And then, of course, the, the larger description of the fruit of the Spirit comes in. And it's a, those are conditions, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. Those are not feelings, but they have feelings associated with them. They are conditions. And the feelings associated with them are good feelings that strengthen us and encourage us in a direction that leads to a life that is productive of good and is creative and uh, lives in the power of God 
of for now and forever. So we let our minds dwell on those things, and that helps us deal with feelings. Now, this evening, we want to spend most of our time dealing with something closely associated with that, and that is the body. Because most feelings are located in your body. Okay, now I have learned how to pray for people who are depressed or wounded uh, by focusing on the body because the feelings focus in the body. And you have to deal with that specifically if you're going to be able to help them. Uh, the body is the place where the feelings come. And they are located actually many times very specifically in your back or your arms or your chest. Uh, and the body uh, is uh, the place where our character, our feelings, our thoughts even uh, settle into our personality. And then the body begins to run in terms of them. And sometimes that's not good. So I want to give you this passage from Paul, the first one that's up here, to begin our discussion of this matter tonight. Um, and uh, most of these passages uh, I discuss in a chapter in the book, The Spirit of the Discipline, called Paul's Psychology of Redemption. Paul's Psychology of Redemption. Uh, you don't want to think that Paul is just a sort of country bumpkin that shows up with a piece of straw in his teeth and stands around and talks. Paul was a great mind. Sir William Ramsey, one of the great scholars of some decades ago of the, West, of the, of the Roman and Greek world, says that in Paul, for the first time since Aristotle... Greek philosophy made a step forward. Now that is the right perspective to take on Paul. He is responding to the issues and providing an answer to the questions that was raised by Plato and Aristotle and others, and Greek philosophy never solved the problems. They never solved them. And uh, you don't want to hear a lecture on that tonight, but I do lecture on it regularly and go into the details of the text. And by the time Paul comes, comes on the scene, you do see, see two groups of Greek philosophers mentioned by him. Those are the Stoics and the Epicureans. And actually, the Epicureans were very like a, a system of churches and local organizations that met to try to solve the problems of human life. And, uh, and they had a lot of wisdom. But Paul is the one who really tells us how to deal with life in the light of life in the kingdom of God. Now, those four questions I gave you this afternoon, you see, the question, who is well off and who is a good person, is always answered in, the ter in terms of the first question. What is real? And if you think about it, you'll see that you can't do it any other way. And if you have been in situations where you've studied Plato and Aristotle and the others, you'll know that their whole recommendation for the best way to live and the kind of person to be is predicated on their understanding of reality. Now, Paul comes on the scene... And with his understanding of reality, which is laid out in his letters, and, uh, and we need to try to practice reading the New Testament in a, in a way that opens us up to the depths of the truths that are there. And unfortunately, perhaps, that has to do with working on these words that I've been working on you with and trying to say, now, what do they really mean? And what is this really saying about what we do? And in this passage that I want to start you with, the first one up here, uh, Paul, uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul is talking about sports. Now, the Greco-Roman world was crazier about sports than we are. I mean, they really were. 
They were just crazy about it. And to be a part of that world, you had to be involved. You couldn't avoid it. And Paul is talking about sports. And uh, verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? They all run. But only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. And everyone who competes in the games. There's some, I understand there's some games going on now. Isn't that true? <laughs> um, exercises self-control in all things. That's a little scary, and uh, it can go bad because people can overdo it, and actually that happens in sports. Uh, exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, a little crown of wild olives that they wore if they won. But we, an imperishable crown. We're running for, that's the invisible landscape, you see. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. And now here is 27. I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, that can give a wrong impression of the attitude towards the body, but it says something extremely important. In the first place, it says, I do not let my body run my life. I don't let my body run my life. I run my body. The second thing it says that's very important is the body is very smart. It is very smart. And it can trip you up. And you need to make sure that you are dealing with your body in a way that allows you to win the race for Christ, to live a life that is an eternal life. And you have to pay it now. He's not saying that's the only thing he does. It's a larger picture and we've talked about some of those things already, and we'll talk about more of them uh, tomorrow. But this one thing is very important, is to understand the role of the body. Now, you think a moment about how much t attention the ordinary person might pay to the body. Think of the percentage of time in caring for oneself that is given to caring for the body. And you realize it's practically the whole thing. Now, if it were proper care, it would still take a lot of time because we, we have to take care of our body. We're responsible for it. But how much of the time that goes into attending to the body is time spent dealing with things that don't really make any difference. That is, in fact... Uh, expressing a concern about something that might even be harmful. And now it helps us get clear about that if we look on to the next passage, which is in Romans. Romans 6. And Romans 6 is largely about the body. It's about baptism and resurrection life as it applies to the human body. And in verse 12 and 13, 13, he says, Therefore I do not let sin reign, or therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its desires. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Present them to God as those, as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, that's a f uh, try, try thinking about that as a fairly explicit, self-conscious thing that you might do. 
Now you sing a song. We sang the, a song earlier. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. But how about actually devoting your hands and your feet and your eyes to having a time when you actually do this? In so many cases, we read the language and perhaps we think, well, it's just a metaphor. Now, the next passage up here, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And think for a moment now, that might be something that you would do. You would consecrate your bodies to God by an explicit action and time after preparation, you would give it to God. Now, how do you think that would affect the desires that are embedded in the body? I'm, I don't think there's an obvious response to that, folks, but I want you please to think about it. If you have given your bodily parts and members, if you have given them to righteousness, now you've devoted that, you've concentrated, you've said, Lord, these hands are yours. They're your hands. Do you think that would affect what you did with them? Now, you might need to do it. Um, it might be something that you would do over a period of time. Our eyebrows and our shoulders often speak volumes of our attitudes towards people. Just think of how it hurts you. Now, some of us just have faces that unfortunately express things we're not really feeling. <laughs> Like, I, I'm sort of, it's odd, but people often talk about me as humble. I think I just look humble. <laughs> I, I, that must be it, because I don't really think of myself in that way. I, I'd like to be, uh, but uh, I think I just kind of look that way, uh, maybe. Um, and so sometimes we can't help the appearance we give to people. And, and actually, that's a pretty big deal in human affairs uh, in areas of uh, sexuality and so forth it often makes a, a big difference but think of giving your body to Christ now a living sacrifice of course a living sacrifice is a sacrifice that is living not dead right Peter, you remember, speaks of the church being built up of living stones. Living stones are stones that keep moving around. Living sacrifices might want to crawl off the altar now. And then, you know? They have to get back on. So one might think of this as a kind of process now where you would, over a period of time, perhaps with some other people that you are in fellowship with or your family, uh, think of actually giving your members to God. And I believe that if we think in those terms, we will begin to discover a remarkable difference in our bodies. And I believe that I can testify that in my own case, uh, those obviously I have much room for improvement in, in many ways. <laughs> But I have done that, and I did it because an old minister many, many years ago looked at this verse and said, let's do that. Let's do that. And I think it helped me because it gave me a very strong impression that my body belonged to God. It belonged to the Lord. Now, the next uh, passage there on your screen, the body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. The body is for the Lord. You give the body. To your, you don't just say, Lord, I give you my heart. Okay, that's all right. We should do that. But I give you my body. And you make that a point of development over perhaps a day or two. Perhaps you have a period of retreat and silence, and you think about what that means, and 
you give your body for the Lord. But that's not the end of the story. The Lord is for the body. Now, this gives us a different dimension, and we need to spend a little more time on this uh, in uh, Paul to see what he has to say about the body and the life of Christ in the body. So, let's look at 2 Corinthians 4.11. This is right back where we took our discussion of the two landscapes before we get to that in this chapter. Paul is talking about uh, how he lives his life in his body. And uh, you, this is the famous passage in verse 7 of chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians where he brings out his teaching about the treasure and the vessel. And the treasure is Christ. And the vessel here is his bodily existence. And he actually suffered a great deal. And he tells the story of of the things he lived through in this chapter and elsewhere. But look at verse 10 now. He's been saying, well, I, we've been crushed and perplexed and despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Now here, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. What's the picture here? Well, the picture here is giving up your body to Jesus and accepting the weakness that that puts you in in human terms and observing how the spiritual life of Jesus transforms your mortal body so that weak as it is, it becomes this place where the power of Christ is manifested. Now, for him, that meant going about his ministry and spending some time floating around in the Mediterranean Sea and being beaten and all of those things. And he could have avoided those things, you know. He didn't have to go through those. But for the sake of his ministry, he went through them. And in the midst of that, the power of God was manifested. As we were talking this afternoon, when, when you look at the effect of the action, which you often have to do in the rearview mirror. And Paul has, uh, you know, he... Th he came to the point where he actually thought it was funny, the things that had happened to him. Being stoned and left for dead, and um, especially Paul being let down in a basket over a wall to escape the police. And uh, he retells those stories. And you can tell at that point, which is much later in his life, he was enjoying them. He thought they were fun. But, of course, when he was going through it, I'm sure he didn't think it was fun. <laughs> but now he looks at it and he thinks, well, here, what's going on here? The dying of Jesus is going on in my body, and the life of Jesus is being simultaneously manifested. That's what was happening. Now, that's what happens to the living sacrifice. The living sacrifice goes through life with an awareness of the limitations on it that come from living a sacrificial life for Christ. And I hope after our discussion so far, you would think of that in terms of the devotion of your life to what is good under God. I mean, it, very unlikely you're going to be put through what Paul has went through. I, I, I haven't, and I'm glad uh, that I haven't had to do that. But every day I have the opportunity to present my body a living sacrifice and not use it as a way of getting my way, of impressing other people, of having just having pleasure. 
I use it as a way of allowing Christ to live in me as I do good in dependence upon him the best I can, which, of course, leaves a lot to be desired. I know that. But I don't let that stop me because I'm looking for the grace of God that will be manifest in my, as, as Paul would say, my dying body. So that's the idea of the body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the teaching of Paul and of the New Testament, and I really think of the whole Bible, and you find this well worked out in Christian history, the teaching of the whole tradition is that the body contains in it the Holy Spirit. Your body is not your own. It's bought with a price, and it's occupied by the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus is talking about this in John 7, he refers to it as a river of living water. You remember that? He that believeth on me from his belly. That's your body. I'm glad he didn't say from your mouth. You know, it, it doesn't depend on that. It depends on wh who you are. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And now as you go about your life, while on the one hand, you are a mortal, dying body. On the other hand, because of that mortality, you are manifesting the eternal kind of life, the life of the Spirit. Now, see, it's in that context that we go on down the line to the end of the chapter, and we see him saying, though our outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. For temporary light affliction works for us an exceeding greater weight of glory. You all remember the very famous sermon by C.S. Lewis, The Weight of Glory. If you don't know that, I encourage you to look at it. Because the glory is substance. It's substance. And glory, the Jewish term for glory especially, Hebrew term for glory, is a word that indicates substance, weight. Glory is weight. A exceeding greater weight of glory. While we look not at the things that are seen. The two landscapes again. Okay, I've done that enough time and I don't need to go with it again. And I'm hopeful that you will be remembering all of that as we go on now and look at some other things with reference to your body. We've talked, we've talked a little bit about this. And uh, we want to just quickly remind you of a few things we said. Your body is the primary repository of your will and your character. Your body has a knowledge of its own. It knows. It orients you. Uh, it is ready to deal with things in your environment. And that is proper and right. It is, of course, a system of energy, but it's not just blind energy. It is energy under the direction of knowledge. You watch if you have time. Watch these people in the games. And what you see them doing is in their body. It's not in their mind. Obviously, there's a connection. But you have to train it until it is in your body. Your body has knowledge. Your body takes on your character. And actually, we become, we become pretty good at reading character from familiarity with our bodies. It is the point of insertion into our world. That's why it gives us our identity. You get your world by getting your body. You are born uh, in a family at a time, in a place, with a culture, with a language. You get all of that through your body. And, of course, that itself brings a lot of knowledge and direction into your life just by being born. 
Now, you might not like some of it, but you can't get along without the filling out that comes by the way you're put in your body and your, your little power pack then is directed in a different way. It is the primary focus of your kingdom rule. What is your kingdom? Your kingdom is the things you have say over. Okay? And the first thing you have say over is your body, and you don't have say over anything else except through your body. And through your body, you can have say on things on the other side of the world. Your identity uh, fills out your kingdom. And this is what really is meant by saying that it is for the Lord and the Lord is for it. That's the kingdom connection that is in your body. It is for the Lord and the Lord is for it because the Lord is in your kingdom. You have brought him in and you have taken your kingdom into it and now he has taken over that body. So I just want to emphasize that when Paul says the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body, you understand that in kingdom terminology. That's, that's the literal meaning of it. So uh, we've talked a, a little bit about this. I won't spend much more time on it. Uh, the body is ready to go. That's how we live from it. And uh, we are unfortunately caught in a body that's raised in a broken world, a fallen world, and it's turned wrong. So a little child might come in and discover that having a fit is very effective. And so they learn to manipulate their world. And if they aren't careful, they grow up with that teaching. And they're still having a fit when they're 40 years old. That's a fallen world. And they say, well, it's just me or... Uh, that's my nature, or I have a bad temper, or something of that sort, but it actually reflects their choices about how they manage their world. Uh, being raised in a fallen world means you're involved in an economic system that is not directed towards what is good. Good things about it, but there's some bad things about it. And now you have to make a living, and you have to be involved in what goes in it, and you wind, wind up paying taxes, for things that you don't believe in or believe are wrong, but that's a part of living in a fallen world. Remember Isaiah in chapter 6, after he sees the Lord, what he said, Woe is me! Woe is me! I am a man of unclean lips and live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And Isaiah just realizes when he sees the Lord, how out of direction and how turned wrong the world is in, and he realized that it's on his lips too. As you wind up speaking a language that is contaminated from the fallen world in which you live. So uh, we've talked about this now, and I want to move on quickly, but the case of Peter, remember, as an illustration of this. Peter, when he... The little girl said, you're one of them. He didn't say, what shall I say? He just said it. And he did that because it was right there in his mouth. A beautiful biblical phrase in Proverbs is speaking of this wonderful woman that is being glorified, and she should be glorified if she's like that. And one of the things it says is the law of kindness is in her tongue. Mm. See, that's, that's the body. It's got the stuff right in the members, ready to go. And that's what Paul means in Romans 7 when he says, There is another law in my members. And it causes me and leads me to do things that are contrary to my intentions. And he says quite honestly and analytically, uh, it isn't me, because my will is set in another direction. See, the body is ready to go. And so that's, uh, that's the side of it that we want to remember now, and we have to find a way 
of dealing with that. So life as usual runs on these habits, and then we have to learn how to suspend them. And the way we do that is by putting the body to death. You know about mortification? Mortify, a good test of any church, is what is your program of mortification? <laughs> Embarrass the preacher. <laughs> Well, we do know about mortification in that sense, but really mortification in that sense of making someone feel like they want to disappear uh, or die is not what we're talking about here. Uh, the word mortify is related to the word mortgage. <laughs> mortgage, the French word for death in both of them. A mortgage is something that you kill off by degrees. Mort gauge. Mort gauge. You kill it off by degrees and then you take it out have, have a ritual and burn it. Right? Uh, you mortify something by letting it die off. Uh, Paul says in the passage I've quoted 15 times, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things above, for you are dead. You're dead already. You're morted. <laughs> and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you also shall appear with him glorious. The next verse. Mortify, therefore, your members that are upon the earth. Mortify. In Romans 8:13, if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you will live. So your members which are upon the earth, the deeds of the flesh, that's the natural powers, the things you can do without God. The things you can do without God. Now, that's a topic in itself, and we can't go into it very deeply. But back in the Colossians passage, it says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, and, I love the old English, it says, and evil concupiscence. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like something you'd like to be rid of? <laughs> Evil concupiscence. It just means bad desires. Like, for example, wanting to see someone suffer. That would be a bad desire. Malice and so on. And covetousness, which is idolatry. So now those are the things you're going to let die. Just let them die. The Romans passage is very instructive because mortification, one reason why you don't hear much about mortification nowadays is it really turned bad. It went into legalism, and I, I know uh, especially older Christians today who will not hear a word about spiritual disciplines because of how they suffered legalistic mortification when they were kids. Some of these are world world-known ministers. And they are unable to lead their people or their church into programs of spiritual disciplines because they think that's mortification and that's bad and legalism. So when Paul says, if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live, that's really important. He did not say, if you through the flesh do mortify the deeds of the flesh. You do it to the Spirit. You do it through moving into the kingdom of God, that invisible landscape again, and you allow Christ to live in you in such a way that when it comes to these things that need to die off, which are primarily bodily impulses in the way it comes to live, isn't it? when it comes to those, they just stop being interesting. They just stop being interesting. I like the analogy of uh, nature here where you'll see a tree uh, that will perhaps have leaves that turn brown and dead and hang on. 
until the new ones come out. That's a lovely picture. Something else just grows out of you now as a disciple of Jesus. And you just, you can look at something like uh, covetousness or uh, malice, anger. And you just look at it and say, it's not interesting. Now, sin, by the way, you know, I trust, is slop. That's the way you spell sin. It's slop. You don't want to stick your head in slop. Right? Well, I hope not. Yeah. So that's how sin comes to appear. You don't have to choke it to death. Jump on it. Kill it. Repress. And we have to carry that back now to Paul and what he said about keeping his body under. And I'm very concerned about this because I really want people to understand that you are not, you do not gain by making yourself suffer. And when we come to talk about spiritual disciplines tomorrow, now we're going to have more to say about that. That saying, no pain, no gain, is wrong. You'll find lots of pain and no gain, and lots of gain and no pain. It's an expression of a kind of masochistic attitude toward human life. And Christianity historically has had a morbid streak in it. And you see that in many, many cases, but it does not help. Mortification is a process where you stop cultivating something, start cultivating something else, and let it die off. There may be some unpleasant moments. Most of the spiritual disciplines do involve that. That's a part of all training. But there's no special gain uh, to making yourself suffer. Actually, that always has the effect of making you fall into self-righteousness. Because you think, I really have done something here that... So, now, um, we stop the process of allowing our bodies to be governed by things that are self-destructive, and, and you can make your own list of that. Uh, we have problems in many, many areas. We stop the process by training ourselves toward what is good. And that's how you deal with temptation. You don't live in temptation because you turn to something that is good, something that is better. Let's, let's apply it quickly to just such a thing as eating wrongly. And we do a lot of that in our society. We don't have to do that. We can train ourselves to eat properly. That would mean identifying the causes in us that lead us to eat improperly. Maybe nothing more um, than just, I like it. But see, now, that can cease to be a good reason for doing something. I like it. And, and you need to practice things that will help you with that. Fasting is a discipline that helps you learn that if you're hungry, uh, that's no reason to eat. Wow. You know, if you were to tell that to many people in our culture, they would think something was radically wrong. Having an itch is no reason to scratch. I, I'm not kidding you. Okay. <laughs> This is really good practice. You think, oh, I, I have an itch. I must scratch. No, you don't have to scratch. That's a will issue. You say, well, but I want to scratch. Well, so what? <laughs> now, once you get on top of these things, then you want to do something. 
probably it's okay. At least you will have it under control. So now when you think about uh, being led into something that isn't good, you want to remember that there's a difference between the thought and the temptation and the deed. Okay, now I have to talk to you about this because I've already had people asking me about Matthew 5 where Jesus talks about looking upon a woman to lust after her and asking, well, where does that... Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the background here. You, a thought of something is where it comes before your mind with no inclination. No inclination. One might think of doing something wrong and have no inclination to do it whatsoever. That is not a sin. The thought of something wrong is not a sin. And you have to be careful with that because if you don't understand that, you will think you thought of something wrong and that it was a sin, and you'll get depressed over that and have to go get a donut <laughs> or something just to get you over your failure. Right? But it is not a sin. Now, temptation is where you not have the thought, you have the inclination. You are now inclined to do it. It's not a sin. But you're better off if you're not there. Much better off if you're not there. So we want to stay out of that. And one of the ways we stay out of that is directing our thoughts. Because if we don't visit the thing in the thought, we will not have to deal with the inclination. But if we have the inclination, that is not wrong. And this is, these are sins of commission, omission, all kinds of things. Sin is where our will says yes. I have to tell my students in ethics that a thief is not someone who steals necessarily, but someone who would steal if the situation were right. That person has the soul of a thief. Because, you know, you have to move to that level of understanding or you can't understand righteousness or the opposite of what that is. So now, with our bodies, we want to be careful about where we are, even with thought. There are some things that you don't even want to think about. My grandmother, uh, the worst thing she could think about was shucks and tobacco. <laughs> shucks and tobacco. And you... That was, that was how she cursed. Right? She didn't curse. But that she could say, shucks and tobacco. And that's about as bad a thing as she could think of. And she didn't have a problem with temptations. And she was an unbelievably holy person. One of the most influential people in my own life was my maternal grandmother. And she gave me an impression of what purity of mind meant. And that has been very helpful to me, not by any means that I've always followed the path on this, because I, I have been down the road and learned my lessons by failure. Uh, but it's very interesting. What you can think of, is a mark of where your mind is. That's why you oughtn't to watch the news too much. It enables you to think about things you shouldn't be thinking about, especially important for children. You know. uh, so now our body determines where we put our minds, and we have to be careful with our bodies so that our minds will not have even thoughts of things 
that we must. Now you say, but I'm an American. I can think what I want to. Yes, you are. <laughs> you are an American. You, you have freedom of thought. You do not have freedom from the consequences of the thoughts you choose. That's different. You can choose your thoughts, but you cannot choose the consequences of the thoughts. So now, we need to train our bodies not to be in temptation. And if we do that, then our bodies can turn towards what is good, and what is not good will drop off because it will stop being interesting. Gossip. Uh, again, I want to repeat. I, I, I talk about these things to be helpful. I don't want anyone to feel condemned about it. It doesn't help. Ask yourself, why do people gossip? What is it that brings them to the point of saying things that are not helpful? Well, frankly, I will tell you, gossip is a way of achieving intimacy. That's, that's what drives gossip. If I have a little tidbit to share with you, well, we have intimacy around that. Now, do I need intimacy? Uh, everyone needs intimacy. Intimacy is basically shared experience. And it is built into our needs of life to be intimate. What is intimacy with God? You ever hear people talk about intimacy with God? Intimacy with God is shared experience with God. Now, that can be worship. It can be prayer. It can also be acting with God in your life. And all of those are ways of being intimate with God. Intimacy is really important. But now why is it that someone would buy intimacy in a way that would be not helpful, hurtful uh, to others? Why? Well, they don't have intimacy in the right way. So what is the answer to gossip, which is a bodily behavior? The answer is intimacy. Intimacy with God, intimacy with friends a warmth of life that allows you not to need intimacy bought at the price of goodness and righteousness. Many times people are betrayed in the sexual area because they are seeking intimacy. And many times leaders fall because they are actually very lonely. And this is one of the seductions of Internet sex. It's one reason why many people fall through contacts made on the Internet. is because the Internet creates a sense of intimacy. It's the sense of we have something together that no one else shares. Stolen bread is sweet, the Bible says. Now, a body that is rested, that is nourished in a healthy way, that is living in warm relationships, with uh, meaningful relationships with others, you see, that body is in a position where it's going to go for what is good. The body habituated to goodness makes the members of the body slaves to righteousness. We read that passage in... Romans 6, slaves, servants of righteousness. Um, the habits of wrongdoing without thinking or thinking too late uh, are replaced by habits of right doing. Why do you do the right thing? That's how your body is set. That's how your body is set. And I know that many of you folks here, you're right into this. This is how you live. Your body is turned in the right way. And it saves you incredible amounts of grief to have it in that way. And the pope, perhaps the people around you who look at you and their bodies are set in the wrong way, they think you're a fool. That's what evil does to the mind. It messes it up where you can't 
identify the things that are good. And our mortal bodies, are, when that word is used in Romans here, it means our dying bodies, mortal bodies, dying bodies, are given divine life from the Spirit. And so now we are uh, at the point where we need to say that disciplines begin to come into our submission of our body as living sacrifices. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow. Just a few more points here. The body is no longer used just to gratify desire. It is not to dominate others by force, violence, seduction. And a lot of the uh, solicitations that come to us from the various media are invitations to use your body for force of one kind or another. You know, dressing for success. You ever seen that book? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's that's not inherently something that is wrong. But if that's your your form of operation, uh, that's force. You're using your body not as a way to glorify God, but to glorify you. Then, of course, violence is the use of the body, and that happens in many forms. And then seduction. The body is no longer a pleasure factory. So, doing things just to get pleasure out of your body. Uh, nothing wrong with having pleasure in your body. It's when that becomes a governing force. And you're no longer able then to be guided by what is good. Uh, not something to be protected at all cost. Your body is a living sacrifice. Uh, you have surrendered it to God. It's in His care. And He's the one who protects it. This is very profound in how we think about our health as well as how we pray for others for healing. And that's crucial about how the body looks. To be cared for for what is good. We care for our body for what is good. We need energy. We need health. I've mentioned sleep because sleep, we are a sleep-deprived culture. Do you know that? Yes. And there are many problems with sleep. I constantly minister to people who can't go to sleep. And we need to be able to sleep well. Uh, he giveth his beloved sleep, the Scripture says. Sleep is God's idea. It's a good idea. And we need to take care of our body that way. We need to have appropriate exercise, all the things that will help our bodies function well until God is ready to promote us. And... Uh, so these are just some things that uh, we would think about. Now then, the, sub the subordination. This will help us, I think, deal with the previous. There are two ways of subordination. One is destructive and one is constructive. Improper subordination, the body first. And you have to think about how life runs on that model, the body first and how many people uh, are engaged in life in that way. Then the soul under that, life uh, in the, the person, then the mind under that, the spirit under that, and God last of all. And for many people, that's really the order of life. The proper form over on the right, God first, spirit Next, mind, next, soul, next, body, last. We still take care of it. We respect it. We recognize the goodness of it. We're not using it as something that is primary, first, above all. That includes things that we've talked about, like fear of death and so on. We're released from that. The body has its place. We take care of it. We use it for the glory of God. But it is not what runs our life. That's the fundamental point. 
And if we make the switch, then having an eternal life now is opened up to us. If we don't make the switch, it's almost impossible to think in terms of having an eternal kind of life now. Because we are living what Paul called the mind of the flesh. That he says cannot be subject to the law of God. God cannot work with it. Because we've got the wrong things in the first place. So once we have that established, then we see God flowing through the body. Living water from the belly, we talked about that. Now, this is not a metaphor. This is what comes from the Spirit flowing through your body. The Holy Spirit giving it life and uh, uh, the parts of the body then come into play with special functions. Uh, the statement here from Proverbs, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. A wholesome tongue. Uh, grace, Paul said, I pointed out earlier, let your words be with grace. And that's the gift. We see the Holy Spirit now is working through your body. And that is a primary form of witnessing. And we want to be careful about witnessing when our body is not witnessing or when our body is witnessing to the wrong thing uh, because we will hurt people more than we will help them. What does our body testify to? Well, hopefully the reality of the kingdom of God, the resurrection life of Christ. And we don't have to assault people with that. It will be obvious. It will be obvious. You're not glowing yet, but maybe you're starting to shine a little bit. And people pick this up. Your body bears witness to the reality of the kingdom and the spirit. And, and now, if you haven't thought about this, you may think, that's crazy. But what I'm saying, think about it and observe and see if it isn't true. Because you now you're a person that's living in the invisible landscape and the invisible landscape begins to be visible in the energy and direction and goodness that is in your body. Gifting by laying on of hands, that's a primary function of the people of Christ is laying on of hands. Why lay on hands? It's physical contact, what is in your body. You know the stories of the gospel. You know the little lady who said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. And whenever she did, then Jesus felt the power that was in his body flow out. Now, not everyone observed it. Not everyone was looking, but he observed it. And then, of course, finally, healing by physical contact. What do you believe is going on when you pray for healing with someone, lay hands on them? A power that is in you goes into them. Now, again, try it out, okay? If this is too spooky for you, uh, just sort of be open and observant and see if you don't understand and experience this for yourself. And your confidence will grow as you go along. Oh, we're over time. Uh, okay. Uh, well, just this. Have we, through a definite act and positioning of ourselves before God, given our body to God? Most people have never been taught about this, and they've never done this. And so... What I'm saying to you this evening as a part of learning about having an eternal life now, be willing to do this. If we have not done this, it will continue to be a, the body will continue to be a barrier to living the eternal kind of life. It will continue to be a holdout from God's kingdom. And that's what you want to Find a way to get beyond, and a way to do that is to give your body up to God.
All right. Let's stop there, Peter. And if we have questions now or comments, uh, let's see. We have time for a few. Um, the, the first one I wanted to, um, to bring up from afternoon sessions, so there, were, there were actually several that came in about the role of feelings in the kingdom of God. Good, good. Um, why, and someone was asking why they're important in a positive sense. Another person was asking about the appropriateness of, of raising feelings through certain types of worship music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk about those aspects? Well, the, the positive uh, sense is right parallel to the negative sense. Remember, feelings carry you to something. They carry you to something. Desire, feeling, uh, worship, for example. Why is feeling important in worship? It is. You don't try to get feeling, but as you move into worship, the feelings that you experience carry your mind and your body more to God. See, feeling carries you in a direction. And so good feelings that come from good things, Paul's idea, whatever is true, whatever is good, so forth, all feelings will always be associated with that, and they will carry you toward it. And feelings are a part of the human self, and we want everything to be directed in the right way. So the, the important point here is to understand that feelings are directional. Some are less so than others. The feeling of dizziness doesn't take you to some definite object like the feeling of hunger does. But it will move you. And so that's basically the, uh, the thing we need to understand in that connection. Um, do we have one from the floor? I've got several here. If, we, if there's nobody immediately ready, there's one back there. You've uh, said a few things today about God. I'm, I'm have, hang on uh, so I'll we can use the mic. You said a few things today about God, um, like it's surprising if he did not love. Yes, if he didn't love me. If he didn't love, which, which were new ideas for me. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could say... A little bit more about what God is like. Mm -hmm. um, yes, maybe um. especially addressing prevalent evangelical misperceptions about God. Well, I'll try. Uh, the basic teaching of the scripture and actually of the deepest, I think, the deepest people in the Christ Christian tradition. And these sometimes are not well known, like, for example, Charles Finney wrote a systematic theology, and it's almost totally about the love of God. The basic teaching is that God is focused in an infinite way on creating what is good. That is basic love. Love focuses on the promotion of what is good. And if you love a particular thing, then you focus on the particular good of that thing. So when God finished creation, according to the story in Genesis, he looked at it and he said, that's good. That's good. So now that's God. So now, since God is love, it would be surprising if he didn't love me. Since he is love, it would be surprising if he didn't love all of his creation. He does. The interesting thing is that people wonder at this, and that is a reflection of their own sense of unworthiness, and that's good. That's good. But to think that God is basically mad and unhappy at you is a mistake about God's nature. So uh, that's what we need to revise, is this idea that somehow what's surprising is that God loves people. And, and that does, I think, come out of the recognition that we're not right with God. But see, that doesn't slow him down one bit. As Jesus taught, he sends his rain and his son on the just and on the unjust. And that's a passage in which he's telling us to be like that to have the nature of God, and that way 
be the children of our Father, which is in heaven. In biblical language, when it says you're the child of something, that means you have their nature. Right? It's like J uh, Jesus' nickname for John and James was sons of thunder because they were always thundering. Right? Would you like us to call down fire? <laughs> so he's referred to children of wrath. Um, I have another one over here. Um, I believe someone has asked. I believe you said addictions are a product of an impoverished life, and perhaps one should focus on the issue. Or could we focus on the issue of the impoverished life and say more about how to, practically speaking, transform from impoverishment to abundance? And you know, yes. case studies. That's a, a wonderful issue because if you if you want to help uh, addicts um, on anything. You have to locate what is it, what is the vacuum in their lives that is driving the addiction. Because in nearly every case, they know that this is not good. And nearly every case, they want to try to stop it. And what is driving them is a vacuum in their life plus their habits. And you have to deal with this, those separately. But it's, it's very difficult... Now, let me say something. Please don't take it wrong about Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is a wonderful thing. It is a gift of humanity. But you can be sober and be a very miserable person. And so now we, uh, the person who goes to AA and is helped by it is a person who realizes, for example, they're going to die or their family is going to leave them, or they're going to kill their family if they don't stop drinking. Stopping drinking is big. But you can still be a miserable, mean person and be sober. So now what we need to do is help people understand what's driving it and see what can be done to help them. And, of course, it is simply true that many people have been freed from addiction to alcohol or other things just by discovering the richness of life in Christ. That happens. Praise God indeed. And that's, uh, we want to realize that when we're trying to help people. Uh, but if that happens, it will be because their lives are no longer empty. And, uh, and the, the form of religion can be not very helpful because if it's a strongly legalistic one, it will not fill the hunger of the soul. And people may get help for a while but not be able to continue because it doesn't fill out what they need to have filled out. So that's a start. Floor? Anybody? How does uh, mortifying the flesh in the way you've talked about tonight um, free us to, to grow in grace while also being honest about our faults, our sins, our mm -hmm. addictions, just being able to be honest and transparent with people? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I think it's uh, my thing. I would put the emphasis on the other way around that growing in grace is what mortifies the flesh. Growing in grace is what mortifies the flesh. Now, there is, a, there is a period in there where you're going to have to deny it and say no to it. And that's what Paul is talking about when he says, I buffet my body and keep it under. So there is a period of that. There's an element in that. But the basic idea is that you mortify something by growing in grace. And in the standard cases that trouble us so much, things like... Uh, drug addiction, uh, pornography, and so on. The basic problem is that we tend to not go about it by growing in grace, but by trying to stuff it down and sit on it and make it go away, and it just doesn't happen that way. That's what I call mortifying the flesh by the flesh. And that is what gave a very bad name to mortification was it came to be a way of just legalistically trying to suppress and deny desires that are there rather than a way of finding grace to change in ways that make 
what needs to be mortified uh, simply not interesting. I, I'm afraid that may be one of the strangest things I say to you, but that, that really that's the heart of the matter, is you turn to something that is good and you receive grace. And what has been a tyranny over you simply stops being interesting. So I may be wrong about that, but at least I want you to know that that's what I'm saying. Okay. And in terms of the body as well as the other things we've talked about already today, that's really got to be the emphasis. It's, it's, it's good that pulls the wagon of sanctification. Goodness does. Not resistance to evil, but goodness. Now, you have to make the step of faith into the kingdom, begin to experience it before that takes hold. And there is, I repeat, always a point of resistance that requires some effort. But in conjunction with that, the experience of the goodness and fullness of life in the kingdom of God is what pulls the wagon. It is not. And that includes, of course, service to others, uh, proclamation of the gospel, service in your local congregation. Those are central. And uh, we dwell there and we began to overcome what to another person just trying to fight it off just sees as impossible. And that's, that's very common. Also, that may regard professional help, counseling, or whatever is available. That's good. That's not bad. I'm not, tell I'm not saying don't do that. If, if I said that, the, my wife would reach me from California right now on the spot <laughs> because uh, she is a marriage and family counselor, has been one for 35, 40 years, and a very effective one. And I believe it. I'm not just saying that because she had reached me. I, I know that. <laughs> I know that this has helped so many people. Uh, someone here was talking about a program, uh, Here's Life, or something of that sort. I forget the name of it that is developed by a friend of Jane and mine. Uh, it's counseling, and uh, it's a wonderful program. And where the, that's good. That's good. You go for what will help. I have. Um, not, I hope I'm not being too clever here, but I've got two questions that seem to be related. Um, one a person is asking for you to expound on First Corinthians 6:18 about the uniqueness of sexual sins and what they do to our what 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 their unique consequences are for the body. And another person is asking about the relationship of sexual identity, sorts of sins, and the body, and the, the back and forth of that. Where does that? Where does that come from? Which way does the influence go, for example? What's that last one? No, I didn't. Um, the inf like sexual, sins of sexual identity or yeah. orientation. And I, th I think those two are a little bit related. Well, so. they are definitely related. Uh, and it's because, as Paul very graphically explains, of the kind of unity of bodies that occurs in sexual relations, and that would include uh, all kinds of sexual relations. Mm -hmm. And he says that if you join yourself to uh, a prostitute, you are taking into your body the evil that is in her body. And that would be true in any kind of sexual relationship that was wrong. It's the, it's the intimacy of the body. And actually, that's just a part of the same story as the laying on of hands. Bodily contact transfers personal reality. It transfers it. Now, I don't, thank God, don't have a lot of experience in this, um, and I don't really know how to talk about it as, as closely as I should, but, I mean, you have to think about what happens between two people that are engaged in wrong sexual contact. You have to think in terms of what it does to their feelings, the way they perceive their world, to think about themselves and think about others. And it's just the proximity. That's the whole thing. 
but you have to understand then that proximity is reality. It isn't, I, I say in some of my books, and I say it often in lectures, there is no such thing as casual sex. Just approaching it as casual is itself a terrible desecration of the persons who are involved in it. And that's one of the myths of our society. Oh, recreational sex, casual sex, and so forth. It's never that. Never. And so that's, that's and of course then homosexual relations and so on, the conditions under which they occur, uh, they're very, very destructive to the persons involved in them. And now I say that here, but I say it in other contexts where it's a long battle to work that out and say why that is true. Because again, the whole world almost is set against that. And so you can have what most people know about things like the, the bathhouses in San Francisco. Of course, that's just one place. It's not unique to that place. I mean, you have that all around the world. And uh, I don't need to go into what happens there. But the effect of that on the persons involved is what, what makes this true and important. And Paul knew about that. You know, he, he lived in the real world. There wasn't anything that goes on now that he didn't know about. And, uh, I'm sure he decided not to spend a lot of time thinking about it, but still he knew about it and, and wrote on it. Okay, another question, comment over here. I'd like to return to um, what you said about God and anger. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm really, really happy to know that God, I want to have it confirmed, because I, I think I always believed it, that, that God does not and cannot, maybe, get angry at me. Um, but what would you say about his, his emotions, assuming... God has emotions. Mm -hmm. okay. I do assume that. All right. Uh, his, his emotions at humankind right. when, when he wiped it out mm -hmm. and saved Noah. Yeah. What was his emotion well, with that act? For one thing, he was very disappointed. And that's what the wording there says. He was sorry he made human beings. And... Uh, uh, he was prepared to do something radical to try to change the course. So, um... Now, see, here we need to go into the details of what... Don't sit down. You're asking a great question. Uh, so please just stay with me here now. Uh, what exactly... Ask your, here's again. How do you think God's face looked when he decided to do the flood? Someone said sad. Hmm. God has an emotional life. Persons, there are no such things as persons without emotions. Dr. Spock is a figment of television, whatever you call it. Persons have emotions. Emotions come with thoughts. So God has them. Now the question is, uh, what are their, what's the quality? I think God could be angry. I, I don't want to say he never gets angry. I think he does. But you know, what anger means depends on who the person is. And um, I think his anger is safely within control of what is good. It's like Jesus got angry, mm, yes. you know, yeah. and, but it was Jesus. And people say, well, you know, I often talk about how it's best to avoid anger, and people say, well, Jesus got angry, and all I can say is I can trust him with things I can't trust myself. 
because he has it under control in a way that I probably wouldn't. Uh, anger is a very powerful force. So um, I hope that's some kind of response to it. I surely want to affirm with you that God has, <coughs> has emotions, even things like delight, clearly, joy. And I, I think he has emotions probably of a scale and nature that we couldn't very well understand. Now, the other thing I'd like to ask is, um, it just occurred to me now, um, is uh, did God feel, again, emotions, do you think God felt compassion for the, for the um, Canaanites? Yes. Their children I during do. Joshua's time when they had to wipe them out. I feel. I, I not only do so, that, but I think that he felt compassion and that those who may have deserved it are in his company now. I don't feel like every one among the Canaanites were immersed in the evil which he felt had to be destroyed in order to allow the development of a different kind of community. That's God. I think that'll be the last question. Yeah, we're, we're, we're at 9.30. It's, it's about time. So we'll pick this up tomorrow. Thank you, Dallas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.